My name is Omid Farouksad. I was born in Tehran on February 18, 1969. My parents were Ali Farouksad, my father, and Shamsi Khafari, my mother. I have an older brother named Ami Farouksad. I was born into a middle class family. Education was a very important part of our family from ever since I can remember. My dad in particular was an avid reader. My earliest memories of him was usually just a stack of book next to him wherever he was sitting or his bed. Um, he loved poetry, he loved to read, um, and he instilled this in us. From ever since I, I can remember where he would try to give me advice, uh, his one advice was that he, you, you got to live your life uh, so that the, what you contribute and the impact of your work uh, lives on after you're gone. And, and he would cite poets and scientists whose names are household names long after they're gone, and this was really important to him. He was um, a really generous guy, a lovely guy, um, and, um, and I tried to um, live up to his expectation. I, I don't think I've quite reached what he was aiming for, which is that um, my name or my impact will last after I'm gone, but still reaching for that, um, reaching for that target. Um, I think something like the Mustafa Prize is, is what he would have liked to see, and he would have been quite proud of it. Uh, unfortunately, he's, he passed uh, in 2020, um, and, and he's not here to see this, uh, but I think he's here in spirits um, with me, uh, and, um, and I really want to actually dedicate the Mustafa Prize to him. Um, he was a military guy, he was a Sarhang, so I want to dedicate the Mustafa Prize to Sarhang Ali Farrukhzad. And I think he would have been greatly honored and, and happy to see, to see me get this. When I was in Iran, I went to a school uh, named Armaghan Tarbiyat, and it wasn't until the beginning of my high school. I was always very interested in science. Uh, I liked building things. Um, um, I remember when I was maybe 10 or 11 years old, uh, I had a, a, a kit uh, to make electric circuits and I would make radios and I would make really complex structures with Legos and I had a microscope and I would look at just about anything uh, under the microscope trying to figure things out. So I was always, from when I remember, uh, into science. Um, the medicine part of it came a bit later. Um, I think it was probably a combination of two factors. Um, one was that uh, I was in Iran during the war um, and I saw the important roles that doctors played and the love people had for doctors and for the kind of job they played. And so that definitely uh, made a lasting impression on me. Um, and then when we moved to the US um, where I studied biology, uh, graduated from the University of Massachusetts with a degree in biology uh, and a minor in chemistry, that I decided to become a doctor, although th at the time it was for maybe a slightly different reason. And the, the, the second reason that weighed into it was at the time I was now an immigrant, and somehow medicine uh, is a ticket to, um, you know, if you would upgrade your social status. Um, and, uh, and so that was, that was the driver of it, but I loved science and from college I went on to uh, Boston University where I studied uh, medicine and I also got a master's degree as well there in medical sciences. And uh, throughout college and medical school um, uh, I was always pursuing research and I looked at the regulation of a number of genes involved in leukocyte activation and adhesion during college and medical school. And uh, during medical school I also uh, uh, went to the U.S. National Cancer Institute uh, for, for a fellowship uh, in, in one of the summers. Um, and then afterwards, uh, after I finished my medical degree, I ended up doing a postdoc um, at MIT in a chemical engineering lab uh, run by Professor Robert Langer. And again, it was like being a fish out of the water where I had trained as a molecular biologist, but I was coming into a lab where I was learning entirely new language, uh, biomaterials, uh, engineering, and those were all foreign to me. Uh, but, but that orthogonal training of being trained as a biologist uh, 
in an engineering lab really became the foundation that was the rest of my, my career. Uh, I ended up uh, finishing my postdoc, ended up doing my clinical training at Harvard Medical School at the Brigham, um, where I also joined the Harvard faculty in 2004. And from the very beginning though, I was again very scientifically driven, uh, and so I pursued research, um, primarily did very little clinical work early on, and then eventually uh, did exclusively research. I started a lab uh, called the Lab of Nanomedicine and Biomaterials, and this is back in 2004. And if you put nanomedicine uh, in a PubMed search, you literally have to go to the first page of the, uh, the search, uh, because by the end of 2003, there were 11 papers published with the term nanomedicine, and by the end of 2004, there were 22 papers published with the term nanomedicine. And I remember vividly that I went to start the Lab of Nanomedicine and Biomaterials, and um, uh, uh, senior folks in my department and, 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 and the institution were asking, well, what, what is this nanomedicine that you're talking about? What does it mean to have a lab of nanomedicine? And, um, but, you know, but a decade later, um, I started a center called the Center for Nanomedicine um, in our institution, which I directed as, as its founding director. Um, and the center then had multiple PIs, um, uh, uh, two that were actually former trainees of my own lab, uh, who are now independent uh, faculty at Harvard Medical School, but, but, but another person also from another department who had joined the center. And basically, uh, research in the area of bio-nanotechnology became core uh, to what I ended up doing. Uh, and that became really the foundation of my, uh, my interest and my academic uh, interest. Uh, and we were very technologically focused uh, versus therapeutic area focused. And by that I mean we weren't interested in solving one specific medical problem. Uh, we were more interested in developing platforms and technologies that could be addressing a range of different problems. And so in that context, we were publishing papers. Um, our papers uh, were fortunate that were regarded favorably by our colleagues and they were highly cited. But we were also very active in filing a lot of patents. Um, uh, and, um, and those patents and those technologies that we developed formed the basis to um, bring new technologies uh, from an academic lab uh, uh, into uh, clinical trials. Uh, and then, and more, more recently, uh, as a commercial product. Um, and I'm very optimistic that uh, the contributions that these technologies and these products will make to science and to medicine will be quite profound. Along the way, and you know, given my interest in uh, bringing technologies from an academic lab uh, into the market. I also ended up uh, going back to MIT where I got a degree in business um, at the MIT Sloan School of Management uh, where I got an MBA. I think the combination of uh, training in medicine, uh, training in molecular biology and later uh, biomaterials and chemistry and engineering and together with business uh, really kind of made an impact in the, in the way my the tra trajectory that my career took. And I would say I learned that in large part because of uh, my mentor, Professor Robert Langer. Um, I've had two North Stars in my life. Uh, first is my wife, uh, who's got impeccable judgment uh, in, in helping me in so many different ways. And second is uh, Professor Robert Langer, or Bob, uh, to most everyone who knows him. Bob has been the most influential role model to me, and not just in science. He's a, a model human being, visionary, but humble, uh, just uh, always says you got to solve big problems. But other than Bob, I've also had other mentors that have helped me in different ways over the years. Uh, Phil Kantoff, Professor Kantoff from Dana Farber Cancer Institute, um, very impactful in my early career as I was pursuing biomedical research. Terry McGuire from Polaris Venture, an excellent human being who's taught me so much about how, how do you uh, try to develop technologies that ends up 
doing, um, uh, doing good for the society. Um, Simon Gelman, um, where I did my clinical training, he was my former chairman. All of these people have taught me in different ways to be a good physician, a good scientist, a good person, a good businessman. Um, and I would say collectively they've been influential in the person that I've become and the, and the professional that I became. During my uh, career and training, I learned the concept of becoming an academic entrepreneur. Um, the term almost seemed like an oxymoron, how can you be an academic and entrepreneur at the same time? But I, but I actually learned uh, largely in the laboratory of Professor Langer and through just watching him uh, do his work that you can be an academic where you're pursuing academic excellence in uh, solving important scientific problems and publishing important papers, but that you're also a catalyst for moving these things forward. Um, and so, you know, over the years then my career grew to being an academic, uh, being a physician, being a scientist, being an inventor, being an entrepreneur. And I would say, most recently, uh, being a philanthropist has also become a part of it. Uh, I feel that giving back is becoming progressively an important part of what is important to me and to my wife. Um, that's been an important focus for us, to be able to give back, and not just to give back in terms of supporting your students and postdoc, but to be able to give back to society uh, in, in ways that uh, demonstrate the gratitude for what has been handed to us over the years, and um, just feel really, really fortunate to be in that position. And progressively, as the years went on, uh, it became easier and easier. Uh, Harvard was a, a significant enabler. Eventually, uh, during my, uh, my clinical training there and my postdoc at MIT and during the Harvard faculty, it made it easy uh, to attract um, really top talent uh, in terms of uh, trainees that came to the lab. And so many of the ideas and innovation that came from our lab was the work of these students and postdocs and they were coming because they wanted to be part of a, an important institution and, and their contribution really made an enormous impact. And, 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 and these things go really in full cycle where eventually you begin to pay it forward. The point that I've always tried to instill that follow myself instead of my family and try to communicate to the folks that have been in my lab is that you got to be resilient. Um, I make this analogy uh, that you have to be like a basketball. The harder you hit the ground, the higher you got to bounce back up. And this has been uh, something that I've deeply followed throughout my career, throughout my life. And so this notion of being resilient and um, and have and, and persevere um, uh, has been an important motto, an important philosophy for me that I've followed, and one that I've tried to instill in my own children, and one that I always conveyed uh, to the folks in my lab as well. Nanoparticle technology for immune tolerance is referred to as mTOR. That technology, uh, together with an enzyme, uricase um, enzyme, is now in phase three clinical trial uh, for treatment of refractory gout. Um, most recently, uh, we developed nanoparticle technology that can help in um, looking at the proteome in a biological system um, and to be able to look at the proteins in an unbiased or untargeted way, in a hypothesis-free way, uh, in ways that was not possible before. That technology is now a commercial technology um, in a company, uh, developing a company called SEER uh, in, in California, uh, where I left my position as a professor at Harvard Medical School uh, to operate the company as its founding CEO. Um, and that is where I'm working today. 
Um, Sear is a company in, in Redwood City, California as our headquarter. We also have offices in San Diego. We're a team of about 160 people. Uh, our commercial product um, uh, last year uh, sold about $15.5 million. It lets a scientist, an investigator, uh, take a biological sample like uh, human blood and to look at proteins um, in that blood uh, rapidly, deeply, uh, uh, in ways that was not possible before. The focus of my academic work has been to develop novel nanotechnologies for medical applications. Key to this is engineering novel nanoparticle technologies that can be used for a range of applications and our focus has been mostly on the therapeutic side over the years. Um, we developed the first targeted controlled release nanoparticles that we brought from discovery to human clinical trials in, in 2011. Uh, that work was ultimately published on the cover of Science Transitional Medicine uh, and received um, wide publicity from the National Cancer Institute, the Prostate Cancer Foundation, and other agencies that were involved in funding it. But it's interesting that as you do that, you end up solving a number of problems. And one of the key problems at the time was, how do you inject a system like a targeted nanoparticle in human um, and avoid uh, immunogenicity? So to solve that problem, I had asked a colleague of mine, uh, Professor Uli Van Andrian from Harvard Medical School, to actually join the scientific advisory board of the company that was developing these targeted nanoparticles. And collaborating with Uli and, and Professor Bob Langer, we started another company that brought those technologies uh, from academic discoveries into human clinical trials. Um, and that technology, the mTOR technology, is now in phase three clinical trials uh, for treatment of refractory gout. But again, it's interesting because as we were trying to solve the problems uh, of translating these nanoparticles for therapeutic applications, one common theme kept coming up, and that is that anytime you take a nanoparticle and you inject it in a biological system, very quickly you end up getting a layer of protein on the surface of the nanoparticles that at the time we would call that biofouling, fouling because it was an undesired outcome. It turned out that a colleague um, uh, in 2007 published a paper, this is Professor Kenneth Dawson, um, published a paper uh, in the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences showing that actually what binds uh, is not fouling, it's actually a reasonably precise interaction that happens as a function of the physical chemical properties of that particle and the, and the biological sample that may be present. And he at the time coined the term protein corona. And so that was the first that term was used. Well, the field of protein corona had moved forward uh, over the years since 2007. And one of the challenges that we were having was that the nanoparticles that we were designing for therapeutic applications would very quickly form this protein corona on the surface. And so then the idea, and there was a, a growing body of literature that by changing nanoparticles, um, uh, one could essentially sample the proteome in a different way. Um, and again, working with um, uh, folks that had joined our lab, we began to develop technologies uh, to see could this technology actually be used for protein sampling. And so that formed the basis to launch another company, SEER, um, where the focus is um, developing technologies that can enable a scientist to look at a biological sample, but to be able to look at the proteins in that sample in an unbiased, untargeted, or in a hypothesis-free way. Now, this was important because since mid-2000s, um, our access to genomic content had progressively grown, in large part because of the scientific contributions that happened academically, but really largely in the industry, in a company called Illumina. Uh, that developed uh, next generation sequencing technologies and commercialized it and allowed for a scientist to look at a biological sample and to be able to read the genetic codes 
very quickly and cost effectively. Today, we've now sequenced over a million human genome, over 10 million exomes. But interestingly, to be able to tie that information from a genomic content to proteomic information has lagged in large part because our access to the proteome was limited. One of the key enablement that uh, the technology was making that was coming from an academic lab was it would allow a scientist to actually have an access to the proteome in, at the speed scale that they could potentially access the genome. Now, these were early days. Again, this was academic work. But, and so there was a lot of risk associated with this. But if we were right about this, then the impact of it would be huge. And so on the basis of that very high risk, but potentially high reward opportunity um, in terms of impact, um, I left my position as a professor at Harvard Medical School, and this is now 2018, the beginning of 2018, I took a sabbatical to, to come and run this newly formed and newly launched company, SEER, uh, in California. Um, fast forward, a year went by like a blink of an eye, uh, and my sabbatical was over. Uh, I then took a leave of absence. Again, another blink of an eye, another year was over. But the technology was moving forward and it became clear that we were onto something, something that could potentially be transformative uh, if we could really do this. But again, the path to doing something exceptional is never linear and straight. Um, and so we, uh, we, we brought together a fantastic team of scientists and leaders uh, across all different dimensions of the organization, protein chemistry, data science, uh, commercialization and marketing and legal, human resources. And we brought just this exceptional team to build this platform and to be able to put it in the hand of the customer and see the impact that the customer would have uh, with access to the proteome. I was very proud that in uh, three short years after launching the company, we shipped our first instrument uh, called the Proteograph Product Suite uh, to our colleagues at Oregon uh, State University and, um, and, um, and, and since then the proteograph in the hands of customers has generated some exceptional data in terms of being able to access the proteome and progressively we're narrowing the gap to impedance match our access to the genome. The day where access to the proteome becomes as readily available as access to the genome, I think fundamentally so much will change in terms of medicine and science because we'll begin to be able to connect genomic information in terms of the biological function and relevance to proteomic content. When we think of application of nanotechnology to human health, usually thought immediately goes to developing nanoparticle technologies um, for medical applications. Uh, these date back to, to 1980s when people began to put drugs in liposome um, or lipid nanoparticles. Uh, the first uh, example of such a thing was approved uh, a drug named Doxel, which is doxorubicin encapsulated liposome. Uh, more recently, attempts were made to not only put the drugs inside of these nanoparticles, but also control the rate by which a drug gets released. Um, and, then, and then even more recently, the ability to target it uh, to specific sites of the body. In fact, um, work that we did uh, that built on uh, uh, some of the earlier work that was done before my time was to target the delivery of these controlled release nanoparticles uh, for delivery of cancer drugs specifically to cancer cells. Other applications of nanotechnologies is developing these nanoparticles to become uh, immune modulators, either activate the immune system uh, or, or, uh, or suppress the immune system. Interestingly, nanoparticles just by virtue of their size, they look a lot like viruses, and our immune system over, over millions of years has evolved to essentially respond to, uh, to viruses. Um, and, um, 
and many viruses are also spherical in shape. Uh, and so you could really use the, the shape and size of the nanoparticles uh, for immune modulation. And so um, we, we initially attempted to develop nanoparticle technology to create a vaccine uh, for smoking cessation. In this case, this was a nanoparticle technology that was designed to target nicotine uh, so that when a person who was attempting to quit smoking uh, would then take a cigarette, the antibodies in the body would circulate and, and uh, bind to the nicotine molecule that would have been absorbed through the lung uh, and block the penetration of the nicotine molecule to the brain so that you wouldn't get the dopaminergic response that you would get with nicotine to help facilitate smoking um, cessation. That drug ended up going to human clinical trial, unfortunately was not successful because the level of nicotine sequestration wasn't enough uh, to really block nicotine penetration in the brain. But then the technology got used for immune tolerance, a very similar nanoparticle that had rapamycin inside. Uh, the company, another one that we started in 2008, a company called Selecta Biosciences, brought this nanoparticle technology into human clinical trial. It's called mTOR. Um, and this nanoparticle works by educating the immune system to consider a biological molecule that it sees uh, to be self or to become tolerant against it. Refractory gout is a, a, a terrible and devastating disease. Um, the treatment of it involves an enzyme uricase that breaks down uric acid. Uh, and uricase uh, as an enzyme is highly immunogenic. And so in order to be able to administer uricase, you need to be able to teach the immune system to consider that enzyme as really a self protein. And so, um, Selected developed this technology, uh, uh, moved this uh, platform into human clinical trial. Today, the drug is actually in phase three clinical trial, right prior to um, uh, hopefully approval at some point in the near term. And that will be a first example of a tolerogenic nanoparticle that can make an immunogenic molecule essentially non-immunogenic and tolerized uh, in, in, in human for applications and the company is now leveraging the same platform to develop a number of other biological molecules that are typically immunogenic um, uh, to make them much more tolerated um, for human applications. Other uses of nanoparticle technology, frankly, we all went through COVID. Um, uh, and, and what a devastating uh, economical and, and human toll uh, that took on, on, on the world. And the solution um, of developing a COVID vaccine really resides on the innovation in nanoparticle technology. And again, um, the, uh, the delivery of messenger RNA, which is a very labile molecule susceptible to rapid degradation in the body can be stabilized when you put messenger RNA uh, in, in nanoparticles, um, in this case, lipid nanoparticles, uh, to be able to deliver them uh, as vaccines. And so the delivery um, or the, the enablement of developing COVID vaccine really resides on the enormous um, effort that went on into designing those nanoparticles to effectively deliver messenger RNA. Um, and the COVID vaccine uh, that was uh, that got developed from Moderna was actually based on foundational technologies that also originated from uh, Professor Bob Langer's lab, uh, work done by other scientists unrelated to me. Other applications of nanotechnology to, to human health involve imaging, uh, nanoparticle technologies can be used to develop um, uh, nanoparticles for MRI contrast agent. Um, Professor Wath 
Ralph Weisleder from Mass General is a pioneer in the space. Um, and, and then more recently, uh, to combine imaging and therapeutic modalities in same nanoparticle systems uh, to develop systems that can both image and treat concurrently or alternatively to even report back when an effective treatment has been developed or sorry, delivered. And these are teranostic nanoparticles, which means both therapeutic and diagnostic at the same time. And those are now in earlier stages of development, um, but a number of them are in, in, in being explored preclinically. And to the best of my knowledge, none has actually moved into human clinical trials yet. But I expect in the future, we will also see examples of these in human clinical trials and hopefully eventually also commercialization. And so I not only was exposed scientifically and learning research, but I also learned the process or the steps that one takes to take an academic innovation, uh, moving it forward commercially toward um, developing products. Um, just like in science, there's some basic concepts that you learn, and then once you learn it, you become an expert at it. Uh, the, the idea of being an academic entrepreneur is very similar. There's some key steps that one takes uh, in wanting to commercialize a, a technology or a platform that they develop, course to which obviously always is filing patents. Patents should be strong. Um, this may sound a bit mean, but they should be blocking patent, meaning that they're strong enough that they block others from wanting to do what you want to do. And that's important because if you have strong blocking IP, it becomes easier to attract investor capital uh, to support that work. Uh, the next is that you need to know your strengths and weaknesses. And often as scientists, um, we're very, very strong in one area, but we may not be strong in the other aspects of what it takes to develop a technology. Then the next step would be to build a team, uh, just like a scientist builds a really strong team of students and uh, graduate students and undergraduate students and postdocs. In, in a company setting, you also need to build a really great team of um, uh, industry scientists, business people, colleagues that can help you translate those academic research uh, into, um, uh, into a successful product on the development and later a commercial product. But it's very gratifying to see the work that you do scientifically and publish those work eventually move from animal studies in academic labs into human clinical trials, uh, and then eventually into a commercial product. Quite exciting. Some of the problems that existed uh, in commercializing nanotechnologies are problems that are actually in common in commercializing really any, any types of a therapeutic. Um, which is that you need to make sure the technology that you're developing is, is safe. Um, and usually you do that in animal studies to show safety, uh, and then eventually you need to show safety in human, and then efficacy in human um, uh, in order to develop it. Now, there are also unique challenges with, with, with nanotechnologies. The regulatory agencies uh, initially were not well equipped to consider a nanotechnology as a separate class um, of, uh, of a therapeutic. So in fact, initially the way the regulatory agencies viewed it was that a nanoparticle technology is essentially an excipient around an active pharmaceutical ingredient. And so the same set of rules that apply to developing that original drug would also apply, if you would, to developing a nanoparticle version of the same drug. We've become a bit more sophisticated. We now understand the nuances of nanoparticle technologies, uh, that it's not exactly the way that a drug in its parent form would behave. But overcoming some of these uh, regulatory challenges as the scientific community learned um, what these drugs meant in terms of their impact uh, uh, and the way they, the, the unique way that they operate in the human body. 
And then the, the next challenge really, again, the same challenge that applies to almost developing any drug is access to capital. It's quite expensive to bring drugs from an academic setting uh, into human clinical trials and then to go from human clinical trials all the way through to approval. Um, failure is very common along the way. Um, in fact, 6% of drugs that, uh, that enter human clinical trials eventually become an approved drug. So failure along the way happens quite, um, quite often. Um, and if you look at the approved drugs, the number of drugs that actually have a positive return on invested capital is actually a fraction of the ones that get approved. So then if you look at the total number of drugs that actually have a positive return uh, in terms of outcome, uh, is, you know, approaches low single digit um, number in terms of uh, drugs being approved uh, and, and be a, a good investment uh, that enters trial. Same challenges exist uh, also um, with nanotechnology drugs. Now the one unique aspect of commercializing nanotechnology drug, and this applies to just about every one of them with the exception of COVID vaccine, is that these drugs rarely become uh, blockbuster drugs. And there's a reason for that. Other than COVID vaccine, that fundamentally changed what was not possible and made it possible, for the most part, the impact that the nanotechnology therapeutics or the nanotherapeutics have had has not been dramatic enough in terms of improvement as compared to the parent drug to merit a significant um, value creation for that drug later on. So we've not had any large blockbuster nanotechnology drugs for example, the way we've seen happen in biologic drugs or some of the small molecule drugs. So that's yet another challenge. And what that does is it makes it even more difficult to access capital when you want to develop nanotechnology drug versus conventional drugs or biological drugs. Um, another area that I think is probably worth highlighting is that nanotechnology uh, and developing nanoparticle drugs also is a highly specialized product development. So the access to the right human capital, the scientific skill set needed for um, design, scale up, manufacturing, th those talent are much, much harder to find than let's say the, the types of talent it takes to develop small molecule drugs or today also biologic drugs, because again, much, much more common in terms of the industry and so a lot more access to human capital in those in those space so i would say the combination of regulatory um uh, financial uh, and human capital probably summarizes well the key challenges in developing nanotechnology drugs with advances in medicine we're beginning to detect diseases earlier and earlier in their course when they're best treated. Um, let me just make an analogy for a second. 30 or 40 years ago, it was common when you were driving by in the street to see a car broken down uh, in, this, in the sideline. Today, that happens a lot less. And the reason is cars have computers and the computers tell you when something needs to be serviced. So you, you maintain your car better, it breaks down less frequently. The same exact thing is happening in medicine. We had developed the technology academically that formed the basis to launch a company, SEER, where I currently serve as the CEO uh, and founder and chairman of the company. Uh, SEER uses nanoparticle technology to, to identify and characterize the proteins that are present in the biological sample. Now, the scientists that are using our technology are applying it for early detection of cancer. In those cases, they're looking at large number of um, cancer patients, but also a large number of healthy subjects, and comparing their proteomic signature that is in their blood from when they are a healthy subject 
as compared to a cancer subject. And they're comparing it from a early stage cancers to later stage cancers to see if those signatures change. Once you identify signatures that are unique to the disease that you're interested in, you can now begin to screen subjects for those novel proteomic signatures and identify the right individuals that need um, further workup that may include additional imaging and other workup to definitively uh, diagnose a disease. In those cases, earlier diagnosis can translate to cure. So many cancers, if caught early, can be curative, but unfortunately are caught late. Examples that I just gave should make it more possible or more feasible to diagnose cancers earlier when it's actually curable. Importantly, you can apply the same ideas and the same platform, not only to cancer, but really to any disease. Um, our, our team has investigated proteomic signatures of uh, healthy subjects, healthy elderly subjects, uh, and, um, and, and elderly subjects that have developed dementia or, or Alzheimer's disease. And what they've identified is that the proteomic signature uh, between a subject that has neurodegenerative diseases versus a healthy subject is actually different. So in, in other applications, they've begun to look at, uh, for, for example, muscular dystrophy and other diseases. But again, any time that you have a disease state that is different from a healthy state in terms of its proteomic signature, Nanoparticle technology can help you identify the proteomic signature that is unique to that disease. I think to solve important medical problems and scientific problems, uh, a multidisciplinary uh, orthogonal view of the same problem by people with different disciplines and expertise is always needed. Um, we are seeing progressively important scientific problems get addressed through the combination of biology, medicine, and most recently data science, coming together and, and, and looking at the, the, the problem differently, but collectively create a solution that neither discipline alone could create on its own. And so I do think that the future of science and future of medicine is absolutely a multidisciplinary one. So yes, I've known about the Mustafa Prize actually since its inception. Uh, Jackie Ying is, is uh, uh, Professor Ying was, uh, was uh, I think, in, in the first cycle of the prize, and I've known Jackie for, for many, many years. And then after that, uh, uh, Professor Ali Khalam Hosseini, whom I've known really, really well as well. In fact, Ali was a graduate student in Bob Langer's lab when I was a postdoc in Bob's lab, so I've known Ali uh, for my entire academic career. Uh, Professor Kamran Nafal, I've also known well uh, as a friend uh, for, uh, for uh, 20 or 30 years, uh, who now chairs the physics department at, at Harvard. So yes, the prize was well known to me, and, and some of the folks that had received the prize in the past were also friends and colleagues of mine over the years. It's an incredible honor and privilege to be nominated uh, for this prize, and uh, especially because it's a prize where you get nominated by, uh, by your peers and colleagues um, who take time to write uh, in, in your support. Uh, just incredible honor and deep, deep gratitude, deep appreciation um, uh, for, for nominating me and also for the selection committee for selecting me for this, for this great prize. Thing. Iran and Persia has a enormously long history and uh, some of the earliest uh, innovation in engineering and design, mathematics and medicine and science and poetry stems um, uh, from the Iranian uh, scientists. Mustafa Prize honors scientists of Islamic background and uh, it's a really appropriate prize in that so much of 
mathematics and science and medicine and poetry, literature and engineering really stems um, from the, uh, the ancient cultures of Persia and other countries in Middle East um, uh, and other Islamic countries. Um, and, and over the last hundreds of years, uh, the relative contributions of these countries has progressively declined. Uh, so I think honoring investigators and scientists uh, from these countries is really appropriate and it shows, um, sends in a strong signal uh, for the strong support that is being played in cultivating innovation among the Muslim scientists and the important work that they're making and the contributions that they're making broadly in the community. The Mustafa Prize um, celebrates scientific accomplishments and I think celebrating science is the foundation for cultivating its importance. Um, and a prize like the Mustafa Prize that also comes um, not only with the recognition but also a large monetary prize sends a very strong signal. Um, in terms of the importance of the work that has been done. Now, in my case, um, the honor is amazing, um, but I've declined the monetary aspect of the prize, but asked the organizations to use that prize money and create an endowment to generate and create a young investigator Mustafa Prize to not only promote the work of senior scientists and recognize the work of senior scientists, but also recognize the amazing work that is being done by some of the junior scientists, Muslim scientists, that I think in the future will fundamentally change the landscape of science and medicine uh, going forward. So I'm deeply honored that um, the Mustafa Prize um, the committee has agreed with my wishes uh, to, um, to take the proceeds of the prize that was coming to me and instead use it in their endowment and to create a young investigator prize on a going forward basis. What's really great about the Mustafa Prize is that its focus is to honor investigators in a range of disciplines that are important uh, in terms of contributions to society. It, it doesn't focus on one area. It, it recognizes investigators in life and medical sciences, investigators in nanoscience and nanotechnology, investigators in, uh, in information and communication technologies, and then basic uh, and engineering sciences. The importance of that is that it isn't so much what field that you're in that uh, it needs that is important, but it's that contribution really to any field of science that is good for society and good for the mankind gets recognized. And I think in that context, uh, the role that the Mustafa Prize plays in paving a level playing field for investigators of any discipline to be recognized, I think is really important. And I think a collaboration among this group can not only pave answering some difficult questions, but also can form a unique network of mentorship uh, for the next generation of scientists who want to be pursuing research in any one of these areas uh, that the laureates um, bring some expertise around the table. One of the points that I always make um, to uh, folks in our lab is that it takes just as much time and money to go after solving big problems than it does to solving smaller problems. But your impact is so much greater when you begin to solve some of the biggest problems that humanity faces. And so I always say, uh, you're better off investing your time and energy to go after big problems, recognizing that uh, the rate of failure 
would be substantially increased. Because if it's easy, then, then it wouldn't be a big problem. But then you also have to, at the same time, persevere um, and bounce back. Be like that basketball that I alluded to earlier, which is that the harder you fall, the higher you rise. But my view has always been that don't uh, get tempted by going after easy problems. Um, challenge yourself to go after big problems and really make a big difference and a big impact. Mm -hmm.